Hey guys, John from FlyMikeAlpha.com and today I'm here to go into a little bit more detail with you on VFR sectional charts. We're going to go into some of the more nitty gritty details that are really helpful to know as you're flying around VFR using these charts as well as preparing for any sort of knowledge test or uh, getting ready for your private pilot check ride or things like that, or even training to the CFI level, it's great to know all the details and what all of these symbols on the chart actually mean. So, we're going to start off with just some of the simple things like VFR checkpoints. What are these little flags here? Well, those little flags symbolize VFR checkpoints. And a VFR checkpoint is just that. It's a checkpoint that someone flying visually would use to identify where they are when they're in the air. So, if someone flies from Venice to Punta Gorda to La Belle, they would probably be using the Punta Gorda Airport, Tucker's Corner, and LaBelle all as VFR checkpoints, maybe even Coral Creek Airport off their right side. So know that near these flags, there's going to be a concentrated amount of VFR traffic all flying over that point to identify it as a VFR checkpoint along their route of flight. So you can expect more VFR traffic there as well as using that as a helpful way to navigate yourself. Other little things that we'll talk about here are going to be how to contact flight service or what these frequencies mean around the VOR. So not, not particularly how we're actually going to contact flight service, but how would we go about it and how do we interpret these numbers? Well, 122.025 here simply means that that is a number we could contact flight service on and transmit and receive to them and over the Punta Gorda VOR. So that antenna there is probably tied together with the Punta Gorda VOR. If we come up here to the Sarasota Vortac, we see 122.1, and in that case, we would have to transmit to flight service on 122.1, and we would receive them over the Sarasota VOR 117.0. So they're receiving us on 122.1, we're receiving them on 117.0. So we will go into another video where we actually explain to you how to call flight service. But the other thing that you need to know here is what flight service are you actually calling first. So we're going to be calling St. Petersburg Radio or St. Petersburg Flight Service when we're in this area near Sarasota. Around Punta Gorda, still St. Petersburg. As we head a little further south, we start to see Miami pop up here. So for the Lee County Vortac, we would be uh, talking to Miami Flight Service. And it doesn't appear that there's actually any... Um, frequencies that they could actually receive us on there. However, there is an RCO at Fort Myers Airport that we could contact Miami Flight Service on, and we see that they can transmit and receive on 122.2, 122.65, and they can receive us on 22.1, and we would have to receive them over one of these other frequencies here. So Fort Myers has an RCO at the airport for Miami Flight Service, Miami Radio. Down here at Naples, they don't have anything listed over the VOR, but they do have an RCO. So the Naples RCO to contact Miami Radio is 123.6, and they can transmit and receive on that frequency. Now, notice here we have this little H in the upper right-hand corner of the Lee County Vortac, and what that little H is, it means that there's high wass available over that VOR frequency, and that's probably why they're not going to be transmitting flight service stuff over that VOR because they want to keep it free and clear so you can listen to the high wasp broadcast which is hazardous in-flight weather advisory service and that's simply going to be any sort of bad weather is going to be broadcast continuously over that frequency by an automated voice along with uh, the Morse code identifier for that station. Now while we're down here we can see some of these blue lines running along near these VORs. This particular blue line which is Q102 is a GPS route or GPS airway. These other blue lines with V, V35 and V521, well that's Victor Airways, Victor 521 and Victor 35. And these Victor Airways are somewhat protected airspace for VFR aircraft to fly along. IFR aircraft use them as well to navigate between VOR stations. So you could be assigned something say uh, along the route of flight or you could let flight service know that your route of flight is from Southwest Florida International via Victor 599 to Thunder and then direct Palm Beach Go Glades Airport. So, um, so this is a way for you to actually show or announce what your route of flight is going to be. You could say I'm going to fly from Southwest Florida International via Victor 521 to Winco intersection 
and then direct Big Cypress. So for search and rescue purposes, you could put that in your flight plan so they knew what route you were flying from the different airports. And you may be navigating along those Victor Airways just because those are obviously good places where you can receive the signal probably pretty well. And it's also echo airspace, so it's protected from uh, people flying in bad weather. It's not golf airspace, so there's slightly higher visibility requirements along there. And also note that this is four nautical miles wide on either side of the airway. So the total airway is eight miles wide, eight nautical miles wide, four nautical miles either side of the center line of the airway. Now, in terms of other routes we see depicted on the chart, we'll also see some VR and IR routes, and these are MTRs. When they're gray like this, those are MTRs for visual military training routes or instrument tra military training routes. Now, we see here we have 1,006, four digits. That means that route is flowing below 1,500 feet AGL. So you're gonna have some big, heavy, fast-moving military traffic below 1,500 feet there. Here we have some military traffic operating above 1,500 feet under instrument flight rules rather than visual flight rules. So those gray lines are MTRs. These VOR intersections, we talked about them briefly, those are just where two Victor Airways or two lines from a VOR, two radials intersect, and they happen to put a name to it. So it helps you identify where you're going in terms of air traffic control. Also, you could say you want to fly from Southwest Florida National via Victor 599 to Thunder, and then via Victor 157 down to, uh, looks like whatever that VOR is there, uh, the Dolphin VOR. So that could be a route of flight for you, and you would use that intersection as a changeover point to switch frequencies to start dialing in the other radial and flying towards the other VOR. Now, as we're talking about VORs, sometimes you'll notice that they're kind of cockeyed, it looks, anyways, towards these lines that run true north, these uh, lines that, longitudinal lines that run true north. Our VORs are offset slightly. The zero degrees is kind of bumped over a little bit. And the reason for that is that these VORs are accounting for magnetic variation in the area. And we can see here that we have isogonic lines that tell us about magnetic variation here at six degrees west. Over here, it's five degrees west. So what that basically means is that flying the 360 radial off the VOR would probably be the same as flying a 360 compass heading uh, if there was no wind but it's not the same as flying true north. So true north is about six degrees off of magnetic north in this particular area of Florida. Over here, it's about five degrees off. And that's just due to the Earth's magnetic pole being not located perfectly at true north. So now that we're talking about flying along these true north lines, let's talk about what they really mean to us, these latitude and longitude lines. Well, for test purposes, they often ask you to identify where an airport lies latitudinally and longitudinally using these lines. So let's use the Venice airport as an example to start here. Well, first thing I'm gonna do, find my lines that run true north and south and east-west here, and I'm going to find some big numbers with these little circles next to them, degrees, 81 degrees, 27 degrees. So now that I've found those two numbers, now I can work my way over and see that, okay, this line here, 27 degrees, 27 degrees, that is, latitude, so 27 degrees north running uh, laterally across the earth. And then I can also find a big 28 up here. So as I zoom out here and I look, I've got 28, I've got 27, and I've got one line in between them. So that must be 27.5. That makes sense. That's how this map is set up scale wise. 27 degrees north, 27.5 north, 28 degrees north. Cool. So now let's move over towards Venice. And instead of expressing this as 27.5, I'm gonna call it in terms of degrees, minutes, seconds. So 27 degrees and 30 minutes instead of 27.5 along here. So if that's 27 minutes, 27 degrees and 30 minutes, and it looks like there's about 29 lines here making this line here the 30th, 30 minute, that means each one of these lines is one minute in terms of measuring in DMS. So I have 27 degrees, one, two, three, four, about four and a half minutes 
is the uh, coordinate for Venice. So 27 degrees north, four and a half minutes. Now we could express that instead of four and a half minutes as four minutes and 30 seconds. So 27, 30 minutes, or 27, four minutes, 30 seconds is the north coordinate for Venice. Now how about our westerly coordinate? We're in the western hemisphere, so we know that 82 uh, pertains to, and 81 pertains to our, uh, our longitude. And so now we've got our 81 here, that's going to be our longitudinal line, our long line, north-south. And we can zoom out a little bit, we've got 81, 82, and we can see there's one line that divides them. If we zoom way out, we can see these squares a little bit better here, but we've got 82 right there, and then we've got a dividing line and then 81. So again, this is set up as 81, 81.5, and 82. Now, once again, not 81.5 here, it's going to be 81 degrees, 30 minutes. So 81 degrees west, 30 minutes. And so now we're going to come over here for Venice, we find 82, and over here would be 82 and a half. So 82 minutes, I'm sorry, 82 degrees and 30 minutes. Now to figure out where Venice lies, we could just count backwards. So we have 82 degrees, 82 degrees, 30 minutes. Now I'm gonna say 82 degrees, 29 minutes, 28, 27, and I'd say that's about 26 and a half. So now I'm going to go ahead and express Venice's position as 82 degrees, 26 minutes, 30 seconds west, 27 degrees, 4 minutes, 30 seconds north. And you can express that however you want. You can express the north coordinate or the west coordinate first. Typically they go uh, north first, your latitude first, and then your longitude. So Venice lies at 27 degrees, 4 and a half minutes north and about 82 degrees 26 and a half minutes west. Just for fun let's go ahead and figure out where the Punta Gorda airport is here. Well it lies just about right along 82 so I'm going to go up here and say that's 82, 81, 59 and we'll just call it 81 degrees 59 minutes west and then 27 I'm going towards the equator so it's going to be less so now I can say 27 that'll be 26, 59 there, 26, 58 57, 56, 55, right about 55. So about 26 degrees, 55 minutes north, and about 81 degrees, 59 minutes west. And that is how we find our latitude and longitude for our airports. Now some other fun little symbols on this chart that may not uh, immediately make sense to you. If we come down here to Miami, well we know blue lines are typically water, and so if blue lines are typically water like this, we see this blue grid here. What that is is just a bunch of man-made canals around the nuclear power plant for cooling water. And those are just that, they're canals. Um, so although it looks like some sort of fancy symbol for a grid or whatever, well, it's just a grid pattern of canals. So that's just water down there. That's very easily identifiable from the air. Looking over here, we have this little black dot followed by buildings. That means there's some buildings on that rather deserted key there because it's unpopulated but we can see some buildings there that can help us identify our position these little asterisks here out in the water are symbols for rocks just isolated rocks here and there so probably a bad place to be sailing but not a bad place to be flying because it's probably really beautiful and you could use these rocks to help pinpoint your location in using those buildings and rocks and key and such like that this little blue dot down here is a marine light of some sort, so probably a lot more visible at night than in the daytime, but something down there, some sort of buoy or something like that, and there's a marine light. Um, probably that marine light is there to keep ships from crossing it to going into the rocky area. See how if they stay to the east of that light, they'll be clear of all those rocks. Other little symbols that are pertinent to us, well, this little parachute symbol here, that means there's skydiving activities going on out of that airport. This symbol here means there's gliders, and there's a couple other things you can check out on the chart legend there for unmanned aerial vehicles and other symbols that they may have near the airport. A little star symbol there is Speedway. They could also use the star symbol as a designation for a stadium, as they do in Tampa, to show where Raymond James Stadium is. And other little things that we'll notice along here is going to be these little black dots every so often. And those little black dots 
denotes something. It could be buildings, could be a water tower. Oftentimes it'll say next to it, but when you see little black dots like that, and this one has a black dot in 62 feet, that's just showing, well, about 62 feet MSL, and there's something there to denote um, where you are. Here, that little black dot's a little prison, and that's very easily identifiable from the air. Here we have pumping stations, pumping station and a mill. So those are just good VFR checkpoints to use to help you identify where you actually are along your route of flight. One other interesting symbol that you may not be familiar with is if you look over here over to Lake Okeechobee, they actually do let you know how high the lake is. This number 16 over here is actually the height of the lake, MSL, uh, so if you're landing on the lake, say in a seaplane, your altimeter should read 16 feet MSL, and that becomes rather pertinent. Uh, maybe not so much in Lake Okeechobee, but certainly in other lakes and other states that are at much higher elevations. For larger lakes, they should actually list what the elevation of the water is in that lake. So here in Lake Okeechobee, the water in that lake is 16 feet higher than the water in the Atlantic or in the Gulf of Mexico. So lastly, let's go ahead and move a little south here and take a look at the southern part of Florida. As we look here, we see all these little islands and these little black dots here all over the place. That just means mini islands, sandbars, basically flats that are often exposed at low tide and covered at high tide. Be an awesome place to have an engine failure if you have, uh, if they're hard at least to land on, but at least you could land in some pretty shallow water and be near a key there to have someone come pick you up. Looking down around here, we see these little symbols here and some letters, VPLYY. Well, these are a lot like our VOR intersections. So the intersections we have, like Carter, that come off of two Victor Airways, and they have a five-letter identifier for it. Well, we have the same thing for GPS, and obviously there's not GPS things or radials that intersect, because GPS is just all over the place. But this is just a fix that you can navigate to, a GPS fix, and that could be something that you could use in a route of flight to help plan it or to let air traffic control know where you are. But that is the VPLYY intersection, very similar to the VPKOE intersection here. And that just denotes a GPS uh, intersection or waypoint, rather, that you could program into your database and fly to that waypoint. Very similar to an intersection like Carter or like Kubik here. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching, and thank you so much for sharing us on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other social media sites. If you have any questions about the video at all, just leave them in the comments below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Be sure to give us a thumbs up on our video, and you can subscribe to us to keep up with all our latest episodes right over here on the right. Also, check out some of these other helpful videos below, and remember, if you can't fly every day, then fly at MikeAlpha.com. We'll see you all next time.